Now, on record, how will NFT impact history is actually the bigger question. So with that, everyone, let's put our hands together for our speakers. We have Mr. Chris Wu, Managing Director of Blue Pool Capital. Mr. Gary Liu, CEO of SCMP, and they will be here to share with us. Also, can I please invite Ms. Akina Ho, Head of Digital Transformation and Innovation, the Great Eagle Company Limited, to share this session and to host for us. Everyone, let's put our hands together. <coughs> all right, the stage is all yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to Jumpstarter. Today, we're going to talk about <coughs> NFT. I'm sure everyone has been talking about NFT as it is the hottest topic right now in the market, especially since after the 5,000 art pieces sold by Beeble, worth 60 mil 69 million US dollars. Now, ever since then, arts, movies, music, property, cars, you name it, can be NFT. But have we ever thought about NFT in journalism and history? That is a very, very different story. Today, we have two very special guests. One is Gary Liu, CEO of South Morning Chinese Post, the visionary and executor of such bold move, and Chris Wu, the managing director of Blue Pool Capital, the investor behind this disruptive idea. So Gary, please tell us um, what's going on, because recently, South Chinese Post uh, kind of spinned off Auto and Artifact Labs, and you are thinking, or already have, moved away from being the CEO of South China Post and leading Artifact Lab yourself. That is a big statement. So what is your vision behind this and what's going on in democratizing digital ownership of history and journalism? Well, thanks, Akina, and thanks to Jumpstarter for having us here today. Um, so the Artifact project at the South China Morning Post started about a year ago now. And it really was a, uh, the, the mission and the purpose of the project, which has now become a company, as you mentioned, really comes at the intersection of three future behaviors that we expect from businesses and uh, consumers. Those three future behaviors, number one, is that organizations and institutions that have historical assets, things that are relevant to not only them, the, the institutions themselves, but to, to, to people around the world, will uh, increasingly want to record or preserve those assets digitally on the blockchain because they know that by preserving things on the blockchain, they are immutable. <clears throat> the second behavior that we are uh, that 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 we believe uh, where is going to be observed around the world is that consumers, because they're spending more and more time in their digital life, that their digital identity will become just as important, if not more important, than their identity in the quote unquote real world, in the physical world. And then the third behavior that uh, we believe we will all observe is that because that identity in the digital world is gonna become so important, the consumption behavior, therefore the things that you buy, the things that matter most to you, the things that you want to own, will increasingly become digital assets, okay? Instead of physical assets. At the intersection of those three behaviors is of course blockchain, and specifically it's the application of blockchain technology that we know of as NFTs, which will allow institutions to make their archives and their assets available for collectors around the world who care about these things. And then because of that, they will become available for education and for usage and understanding to all users around the world. So that intersection is where uh, SCMP started experimenting okay. with our own archives for our own purposes and why, and we realized that a lot of other institutions could use that technology, which is why we spun out a new company to do this for many other companies as well. So it's basically a marketplace, setting a standard for people to do what you guys have been doing. I think you guys have launched already, right? Yes, so we, we, we set a standard, uh, and the, the goal is to set a standard to build a platform and then to build the products so that organizations who have historical assets want to preserve them on the blockchain and then allow them to become decentrally owned and decentrally used can do that uh, in, in an easy way, because none of this is easy. Yes. I mean, SCMP, it took a year for us okay. to build the first version of it, and it's nowhere near perfect, so we want to make it much easier for other organizations to participate. So in truth, a school journal, uh, journalism department or a museum can always go to your platform and take a piece of their history and then mint it 
and become an NFT. That's the vision of the marketplace. Am I correct? Uh, it, it's not a marketplace yet, but not yes, yet. that's the vision of the standard. Okay, yes. got it. So we know that in lots of country, government, institution, value journalism because it's a record of history of the past and the current for the future. So in journalism, free speech, freedom of press is so vital and so key in its um, authenticity of the material. Now, when you do something like this, some people might think, wait a minute, aren't you only putting history in the hand of a selected few elite and maybe powerful organization? And how would you envision what you're building on Web3 will ensure that the integrity of great journalism is preserved? Um, well, what we're trying to achieve is actually the exact opposite of that. So I think that there is, if people think what you just said, um, there is a pretty significant misunderstanding. So let me start with the first thing. This should not change in any way, shape, or form the way that, that reporting is done. The way that major news organizations around the world, independent news organizations around the world, captures, articulates, and then disseminates truth should not change at all. In fact, that freedom of speech, or freedom of press specifically, what that fundamentally means is that journalists can do their job, right? Yeah. What it does not mean, it is not a fundamental right for consumers to get free information. And that's right. really, really important to understand. Now, um, what we are trying to achieve is to build an alternative and new business model that sustains independent journalism, because today, Independent journalism is, is more often than not around the world actually s sponsored by or funded by either uh, governments True. or uh, it's funded by you know, philanthropists or it's funded by advertisers most of the time. None of those groups of people and none of those sources of funding is truly objective, mm. right? Every single group, uh, w one of those groups of people has an implicit bias if not an explicit agenda. The only way, in my opinion, and the opinion of many of my peers in the media, to sustain uh, freedom of press aside from laws is to make sure that there is a long-term sustainable business model that supports independent news gathering. This is why subscriptions and reader revenues are so incredibly important now. And we think that by using NFTs to build a new business model that actually supports journalism, we are just part of the evolution of that philosophy. Now, as a case study, Okay, or in case in point, when we released our 1997 uh, front pages for the South China Morning Post as NFTs, prior to that drop, there was one organization in the world that had access to those front pages, and that was the South China Morning Post. And thank goodness, our leadership today, I believe, is, uh, is a strong leadership. It's a leadership that believes in freedom of press, and so we would never do anything nefarious with that, those assets. Okay. Now, after the drop, those front pages are now owned by hundreds of people around the world. Eventually, our archives will be owned by thousands, if not tens of thousands of people around the world. And it's now up to them to protect it, to preserve it, and make it available to the world. And what they actually did was exactly that. The first utility we released after our drop was what we call Community Wall. We invited everyone who owns these assets now as NFTs to pin the NFTs that they own onto a site and make it publicly and freely available to uh, internet users everywhere. And that's exactly what they did. And for the very first time ever, those 1997 front covers from the South China Morning Post are now available freely for anyone to, to, to peruse. Well, that's amazing. I didn't know that because that was one of the issues. It's like, once you sell them an, an, as NFTs, do they have the right legally to share and post that whenever yes, they want? Absolutely. Excellent. That comes with the right of, uh, right of display. Okay, excellent. So Chris. Now, Chris Wu, you know, you're the MD of Blue Pool Capital. You have uh, been a big investor in Web3. That's why you invested in Animal Brand last year, right? And now that you're looking at uh, Artifacts Labs, how do you see uh, the, the monetary value of that versus the controversy they may arise? Or, you know, that I'm glad Gary had kind of like resolved some of them. And how would you as an investor see that? versus the appreciation in value and what you're doing. Sorry, you're on mute. Hold on, give us one second. Can you say hello to us again? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. As I was saying, I think the market opportunity for Artifact Labs is, is frankly humongous. Um, I think as Gary alluded to, you know, the current um, kind of 
you know, ecosystem for me, traditional media organizations, you know, really are looking for uh, new revenue streams, new mo new ways of monetizing their existing assets, right? And I think, you know, Artifact Labs, you know, in the form of NFTs and, and Web3 is going to present, you know, traditional organizations such as museums and, 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 and news organizations, ways for them to monetize their historical media and artifacts. Um, you know, many of these things are completely, you know, shelved and people don't know about them in a completely new way. Um, I think, you know, one, one thing I always like to flag when people talk about NFTs, I think there's a lot of talk about NFTs today and a lot of it's centered around how much people are making around minting NFTs, right? I think when you started, you you alluded to people selling, you know, his, his something for $69 million. It's a huge sum of money. I think this is, you know, this is, this is fine. It's frankly great, right? It causes a lot of buzz. Um, in the ecosystem and, and, and catches a lot of eyeballs for people who are non-crypto native, non-Web3 native. But frankly, I think we're just scratching the surface for the true potential of NFTs. And, and um, like an example I like to give, uh, so, you know, like I'm, I'm a big, you know, dinosaur fan. I like going to museums and, and looking at dinosaur fossils. If a museum, you know, Museum X, you know, issued a, you know, dinosaur fossil NFT collection, I'm probably one, gonna be one of the first people trying to buy it. Um, so that's really engaging for me, one, uh, in, in a completely different way with that museum organization. But two, I think from the museum's perspective, um, this is a completely new level of information and data they probably never had, right? So if going forward, you know, they wanna do a special T-Rex exhibit and bring their, you know, 100 most, you know, uh, you know, hardcore fans, uh, actually through this NFT collection, they'll probably know and they'll be able to reach out and engage with, you know, these collectors. Like, I, like this is a really basic example, but I think that's a pretty cool example that, you know, gets lost when people are just talking about $69 million people NFTs, right? Um, in terms of like controversies, I like, I think the way we think about it is I don't, frankly, I don't think there will be much controversy. Um, I think, you know, Gary and his team, um, you know, this was all set out in the white paper that was published, over, you know, a year ago. Uh, really, they're striving to run Artifact Labs with the highest level of quality and integrity. Um, I think a good a good kind of baseline in terms of making sure the integrity is maintained is, you know, Artifact Labs is launching, uh, has already established a, a foundation uh, governed by independent council. Um, and Gary, maybe you can mention some of the council members, but these are all independent you know, unaffiliated, you know, KOLs in their respective fields, uh, both in the tech and the media and the, and, the, and the historical archiving space. And it's their job to oversee and develop, you know, the artifact standard and ecosystem. So it's not like, you know, Gary or, or, or Chris can sit around and say, hey, let's go do something and just implement it in, you know, artifact labs or the artifact protocol. This, this has to go through the council and the foundation to do so. Um, so I think, look, in short, I, you know, we're pretty we're pretty excited about what Gary and his team's doing. Um, I, I would argue they're effectively the first mover for for you know building an infrastructure infrastructure layer for historical asset NFTs. And I think the TAM is enormous. So if there are any investors out there, they should <laughs> maybe get Gary's phone number to try to invest. Oh, I appreciate yeah, that. Yes. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> well, I assume you have invested already in Artifact Labs, then, right? All right. Definitely. I have, but yes. we'll, we'll have to see if Gary will give us allocation in his next round. Okay, right. Can I have a bit to Gary? Just a little bit. Of Can't course, much. <laughs> Thank you. So as an investor, uh, I'm glad you talked about the council, the independent council, that's going to actually uh, shape what the future would be like for Artifact Lab. And you guys are the first uh, mover in this space. I'm excited because it's coming from Asia. Being an Asian American, to me, I'm very proud of that. For you as an investor, what else do you want Gary to make sure he lives up to it because he is the leader of this a very amazing yet can be a sensitive subject. What, what kind of stuff that you're going to make sure that he, he, he adhered to, to make sure that it's the freedom of speech, uh, the, the, the freedom of every sources are not suppressed, sh uh, changed or shaped in any way by, like you said earlier, manipulated or controlled by interest group, right? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I mean, I, I can't. I can't tell Gary to do anything because you know, he doesn't work for me. But I, I would say, I would say, you know, we, we Gary and his team, and and you know, I myself also spend time with Gary. We spend a huge amount of time up front making sure, 
you know, I think of this as like an ecosystem and a system we're putting in place and making sure that the right components are there, the, the right uh, governance structures there via the foundation. Um, and I think that's frankly the most important thing because once once it's set up, um, frankly, I don't think you know any investor or Gary should be uh, meddling in the foundation and the council's work, right? So they'll have their mission um, and they will be the ones stewarding you know this protocol and this this the standard going forward. Okay, great, thanks. Well, we're almost up, but one last question. I know that Gary and Chris has been very uh, close friends and work very closely professionally too. Is there one thing that you guys do not see eye to eye? And what is the gap? I would love to hear that. I, I, I actually, um, I wonder. Um, I feel like we agree a lot on the future of the world and why Web3 matters. If there is one thing, Chris, maybe, maybe you'll disagree with me on this too. Uh, but I, I think one area that we have debated in the past is exactly how decentralized the world will become. Neither of us truly believe in the full decentralization of all systems in the world. I think a lot of Web3 purists may believe that. I don't think both, both of us are from a, uh, we'll look at this from a much more practical viewpoint. But I think that I believe in, in, uh, in, in the further decentralization of talent than I think Chris might. And what I mean by that is that beyond the fact that people are now used to working in a distributed way, working from home, working from different countries, um, I think that we're going to go move into a world where more and more of the top talent in all of our industries are going to want to work in a decentralized way, which means they don't even want their employers to know who they are. They may be pseudonymous. They want to be paid in cryptocurrencies in a very different way than, uh, than, than, than we pay and then we manage our teams today. So that is a challenge for operators like myself. Uh, it's a scary, scary challenge. But I don't, I don't know if Chris has come around to that argument that we have to prepare <laughs> for that world. Right. Chris, what about you? No, I would agree. I think that's, that's actually something we've debated uh, exhaustively. And, and, and while I, I commend Gary for having a very forward-thinking view on this, I, I guess I take the more practical view that uh, I'd say most most kind of traditional organizations probably will struggle a little bit to be hiring, you know, full, you know, staff, you know, you know, fleets of people, like a lot of people, um, pseudonymously and paying them in crypto. I think, you know, there there is like a business kind of organizational decision process there. There's obviously going to be government uh, regulatory and tax considerations. I just while I think the idea is really cool, I just think in the near to medium term. Practically speaking, that's probably going to be a little bit harder to achieve. I do agree with that. I think culturally, in a lot of country, working remotely from home is really a big, big, big deal. Like now, like hiring people with no IDs or like paying them in crypto, I think it might be a long way to agree with that. Well, that's the wrap for today. Thank you so much, Chris and Gary. It's a pleasure having this chat with you. And I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akina. Thank you, Gary and Chris.